Bibles, I'm going to ask you to turn with me this morning to the third chapter of the book of Galatians. Paul's writing to the church at Galatia, chapter number three. When you get that, I'm going to ask you to stand for the reading of the word of God this morning. Ask for your prayers this morning. While the world around us is changing, while what seems like the church around us might be changing, how many is thankful today that we serve a God that never changes? Amen. Galatians chapter number 3, and I'm going to begin reading in verse number 1. We'll take our text through verse number 9 this morning, and then we're going to pray. Paul writes Galatians 3, starting in verse 1. He says, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? Ye should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you. This only would I learn of you. Received ye the Spirit by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith? Are ye so foolish? Having begun in the spirit, are ye now made perfect by the flesh? Have ye suffered so many things in vain, if it be yet in vain? He therefore that ministereth to you the spirit and worketh miracles among you, doeth he it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Know ye therefore, they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. Verse 9. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. Let's pray this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you that we have a word that we can go to. And at times we can find comfort. At times we can find strength at others. We can find peace and even joy. But Lord, I'm also thankful for a word that stops us, causes us to see the truth, rebukes the evil, uplifts the righteous that God heals the places that are broken and cuts deep into the places that have been infected with a sickness called sin Lord I ask you to speak to every heart change every life in this house and listening in this hour Lord they come to the knowledge of God that they would find salvation today that they would humble themselves and Turn from their wicked ways today. And seek your face, Lord. Because the time of your coming is nearer than it's ever been. Let us be ready, waiting, watching, and prepared for your coming in this hour. Help us to live for you, God. And in doing so, God, you'll give us the strength to make it possible. We bless you today in Jesus' name. And the church said... <coughs> Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. There's a phrase that you've more than likely heard me use before. And that phrase is, you better stand for something. Because if you don't, you'll fall for anything. I've entitled this message today by the help of the Lord living by faith as we sang just a few minutes ago and I'd say based on that title and then the above statement that I just gave you that you better live by faith in the one who died and rose again to save your soul because if you don't you will follow and or you will believe any and everything that comes your way as we as Human beings, we as the creation of God that's 
living on the earth that he created, have the free choice. We have the ability to believe in what we want and to believe in whom we want to believe in. But the other side of that spectrum is this. We have to understand who has given us the ability to do what we want, believe in what or whom we want to believe in. And really that is the message in our text today. That's what the Apostle Paul is attempting to defend here, to, to justify and to prove here to the church at Galatia. Because the truth that must be understood is that everything, all, all our days, all our breathing moments, all of our lives are in the hands of, an, uh, of the Almighty God, uh, as we talked about in Sunday school this morning, the creator of the universe. Notice that I didn't say a God. I said the God because He is the only Almighty. He is the Elohim. He is the Creator. He is the Maker. He is the Speaker of all things that exist before us. His name, His throne, His Word, they are all eternal. They will never expire. Besides that, there is nothing or no one else to compare Him to today. Paul's argument here is his message to the Galatians. And the message here is that their reason and experience should have convinced them by now the all-sufficiency of faith in whom they should be believing in, who they should be living by faith in, who they should be putting their trust in. Because Paul is wasting no time here in the very beginning. He, he immediately breaks into rebuke here at the beginning of the chapter in verse 1. He says, oh, Foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that ye should not obey the truth before his eyes, Jesus Christ, hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you. He's here, and there's a word here in verse 1. If you, if you look at verse 1, uh, to me it kind of stands out like a, like a sore thumb. It's a strange word, strange, I feel, especially for the Apostle Paul because uh, he's using it not just in this letter, but uh, he, he, he writes all these other books in the New Testament, and, and it, it seems strange that you find this one word here and you don't seem to find it in the rest of the books. Now, if you read the six chapters of this book that we're in today, you would find that this is probably the harshest book that Paul ever wrote. He would say things like in verses 6 and 7 of chapter 1 of Galatians. He says, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ into another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. He goes on in chapter 2 and says in verse 17, But if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. He goes on in chapter 4 and starting in verse 8, he says, How be it then, when you knew not God, you did service unto them which by nature are no gods. But now after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements, whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage? He said in verse 10, you observe days and, and months and, and times and years. He said, I am afraid of you lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. Now let me break down to you kind of in layman's terms what, what Paul is saying here. What he's really doing is he's asking a question. He, he's literally saying, have I wasted my time with you? Because if I did... I wore myself out doing so. I wore myself out doing so. Now that's not the most encouraging words that I've ever heard and probably not the most encouraging words that you've ever heard out of the mouth of the Apostle Paul. And I could go on, but for the sake of time, I'm not going to. You read the six chapters of Galatians on your own time. But the point to understand here is that Paul didn't spend his time uh, ministering to the church at Galatia uh, trying, trying to gain some popularity or, or some solid social standing. Or, or he wasn't trying to make them feel good about themselves. And, and God forbid, he definitely wasn't trying to lead them astray. 
He wasn't trying to send them in the wrong direction. What did we talk about John 10? 10 this morning, the thief cometh not but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. So Paul's intentions are not to take them back down the pathway of sin that they come out of. No. See, on the contrary, he's literally saying, I spent my time preaching the truth to you. To you. That was my heart. So how did you wind up where you are now? And he does so in verse 1 with the word that I said stood out like a sore thumb. Bewitched. I'm not referring to Samantha Stevens that could twitch her nose on daytime television and make something happen. No, no, no. This word bewitched, its definition uh, by the Greek is to bring evil on one by feigning praise upon, to charm one, to be put under a spell. It's an old theater term, actually. It means to masquerade, to act, to play, to make believe. So initially what Paul is saying to these folks beginning with verse 1 is this. You foolish, thoughtless Galatians. You people that I have spent my ministry trying to teach you the truth to lead you in the right direction. Uh, what has charmed you? What has Put on an act for you that you would act the way that you're acting now. Because right before your very eyes, the Lord Jesus was publicly declared to you as crucified when you heard the gospel message. So what happened to you? At what point in the ministering of the truth of the gospel and the power behind it did you go astray? Yes, uh, truly foolish as he's calling them in, in this verse but not the foolish that you would assume the Apostle Paul is talking about or referring to here uh, these are strong words yes uh, bewitched and, 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 and foolish but yet these strong words were absolutely necessary and in calling the Galatians foolish Paul did not mean that they were normal, uh, normally uh, oh, oh, mentally deficient you might say the ancient Greek word there, moros, it's where we get the word moron from. I know we've all heard that word. But it means unwise. It means lack of understanding. It had that idea, and that same word is actually used by the Lord Jesus. In Matthew 7, 26, Jesus says, And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. So foolish meaning disobedient. But he, again, Jesus uses the word in Matthew 25. He says, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps, while the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you, but go ye rather to them that sail and buy. Yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man cometh. So also foolish due to what? Unpreparedness. Foolish not having a sense of urgency of what's lying ahead, of what's truly coming, that we've been warned that is coming this way. And I'm convinced today that the church really doesn't truly believe judgment is coming. The world obviously doesn't. They're living like the devil. 
And I think part of the reason they are is because the church really doesn't believe judgment is coming. And they have zipped their lips and refused to speak out into it. This is an example of no excuse. You were educated. You were taught. You were warned. And you at some point heard the truth. But one of two things has transpired. What he's really saying is you were too lazy to obey and due to your lack of obedience to the word, it caused you to be found in a place opposite to where you should have been. Like, like Eve in the garden. You've listened enough to try and to get by. But when the spirit of subtlety came whispering in your ear a lie, mixed with just enough of the truth, you took it in. The masquerade the, the bewitching, it, it lured some of us in because we failed to have an ear to hear what the Spirit of God was trying to teach and keep us from. It's the idea of someone who can think but fails to use the power of their perception. I, I see it. I hear it. I read it. But I really don't believe it. Or I'm just comfortable enough already in my life that really I don't think it's necessary for me. There's a lot of comfortable people in this world right now. It, it's literally when someone hears, but they refuse to gain enough understanding about what is being said to them, so they fail to come in agreement with it. We're, we're seeing it nowadays, and Jesus uses Matthew 25 uses ten virgin, five wise, and five foolish to illustrate. But in our day, we hear it everywhere. We see it everywhere. Every minute of the day, there's something in the news popping up. There's something in the newspaper popping up. If you do follow social media, you see it in social media. And, and it's, it, it, it's to and fro seeking whom it may devour. Oh, you've got plenty of time. Just live your best life now. Well, Jesus said it like this in Luke 21. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Right. And take heed to yourselves. Listen, at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and cares of this life, and so that day come upon you unaware, for as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch ye therefore and pray always. That is the key right now. Don't let yourself get drawn away by the cares of this life. Don't let the spirits of this world pull you and draw you in. But always watch and pray. Because I can promise you, if you'll spend your time, Jesus said, pray without ceasing. He said, men, I'll always to pray. If you're always praying, you'll always be watching. If you constantly talk to the Lord, you can't take your eyes off of him. Watch you therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. And yet the message that we're hearing in pulpits today, that's why churches are full. Or at least what they're calling churches. I just call them social clubs. Because Christ said he'd build the church. He told us to, to seek the kingdom. He said he'll build the church. And yet men are trying to build what they call churches under their authority and under their prestige and under their social standing. And yet Christ said, leave it alone, Peter. I'll take care of that. You go after the kingdom. And that message we're hearing today is contrary to everything Christ said. Here's the dangerous part. These buildings posing as churches are filling up under that message and they're calling it the gospel. And it's as far from the gospel as Dallas, Texas, from Trenton, Georgia right now. And Paul says in verse 1, Who hath bewitched you? Folks, that phrase right there indicates that their conduct could make you believe that they have been subject to some contrary influence in their life. And Christ calls it an evil eye. You've, you, you've heard me teach this before in Luke 11. What, what does Jesus say? Verse 34, the light of the body is the eye. Therefore, if 
when thine eye is single, thy whole body is also full of light. But when thine eye is evil, meaning double, thy whole body is full of darkness. Take heed, therefore, that the light which is in thee be not darkness. Meaning, you can believe what's in you is right, or what you're believing is right, but it's really darkness when you think it's light. Why? Because your eye's not single, it's double. And when it's double and it has two opinions, it becomes evil. It's Matthew 6. It's, it, 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 it's the Sermon on the Mountain, and, and they all heard it, and, and they were there with Jesus, come straight out of his mouth, not even reading it off the pages in a, in a book. Heard him out of his mouth speak it. They had no excuse. Jesus is first saying what Luke recorded that I just read, and then he follows with this in verse 24 of Matthew 6. No man can serve two masters. It's, it's eye service. You're no longer in agreement singly with the one who created heaven and earth. You're no longer in alignment walking with the Lord Jesus. You are serving two masters. He says, no man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. He says, you cannot serve God and mammon. What's mammon? Anything other than God. Money, fame, social standing, yourself, someone else. And the principle that Paul's referring to in these nine verses, uh, these things that the Galatians already knew, it's things that we as believers should already know, things that had been taught to them. So knowledge and understanding were there, but they were not using them. God has given us everything we need to make it through this world. He's given us power to become the sons of God. He said, they that believed on him, to them gave you power to become the sons of God. He's given us his word, which is instructions to get through this life. We've got everything in front of us. And so if we don't get there to be with him, it won't be his fault. It won't be a shortage of printing. It will be we refused. Yeah. Or we're listening to voices we were never intended to. So knowledge and understanding were there. They weren't using it. Why? Because someone else or something else come along one day and put them under a spell. You know what it's called? Witchcraft. It's witchcraft. It's posing today as preachers, prophets, apostles, and churches. That's what that is. Everybody's being drawn to it. Why? Because they're hearing exactly what their flesh wants to hear. Nobody's telling them how bad they are, but they're telling them how great they are. Just this year, just here we are at the end of the sixth month in 2024, and just in six months, some of the most well-known people in what we call the kingdom have supposed themselves to be in the kingdom, but they've been exposed and they're being brought down. So what's happening is there's some people coming in and they're exalting themselves. There, there's some people coming in and uh, uh, they're being, uh, uh, they're, they're looking at themselves like, you know, for instance, and, and I'm not going to name any names. And if you go look at this after the fact, uh, it, it's your business. There, there, there's a man right now who claims to be a prophet and that got on the World Wide Web on video on national television and is posing the argument that premarital sex is not a sin because the Bible doesn't declare word for word that premarital sex is not a sin. And he's calling himself a prophet and he's playing the Pied Piper and people are following his so-called ministry. I'm going to tell you something. There is a verse in the Bible for every single thing that we'll ever face. And obviously, he doesn't read Paul's letter to the Corinthians. Because in 1 Corinthians 7, 1 through 4, it says, Now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. He says, Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. 
Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power over her own body, but the husband. Likewise, also the husband hath not power over his body, own body, but the wife. So I want to say to you, man, that is supposed to be a prophet, you're not preaching the word of God. You're telling lies. You're sending people to hell with your lies. And you need to shut it up and shut it down. Because you're speaking contrary to the word of God. And you will stand before a fiery eyed judge one day because of it. Meaning what? Get on your face, go to Calvary, and get forgiveness of your sin. They're exalting themselves up high above others. They're telling lies and they're bringing people down at the same time. They're going up, they're bringing other people down. And Jesus said in Matthew 23, 12, And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he, shall, he that humble himself shall be exalted. So whoever exalts himself will be brought down, and whoever is humble will be brought up. Think of all the ones under their fall. I ain't got time to go over anymore. But it's just like the enemy in the garden. They want to use just enough. This is, this is what I firmly believe and I'm moving on. They want to twist the word of God just enough or leave out just enough of the word of God to justify their lifestyle. Look at verse 1 again with me. We're going to move along. He calls them foolish Galatians. He says, Who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evidently set forth crucified among you? It, it, it's clear. What, what Paul is trying to get across here is clear. There's no confusion about it. it, it, it and it, it, it's, if you look at what he's saying just in verse 1, it's kind of like a billboard. Because when you go through the rest of it, he asks these questions. Are you that foolish? What, what in the world? I mean, was the message not clear enough to you? Meaning, the message was so publicly displayed as in a setting on a billboard. And so Paul's obviously wondering, how in the world could y'all be in the shape that you're in and the place that you're in with as great and loud of the message as it was to you of the truth? How could you be that? How much clearer do you need the word of God to be for you to understand what kind of sin you're living in? Paul didn't mean that uh, they literally were there at, at Calvary and saw the crucifixion and saw nails putting his hands in his feet. But uh, the, watching the death of Jesus on the cross, I, I, I can't imagine being there that day and seeing that happen to our Lord. But there were some that were there, and, and to, to some that were there, it might not have meant a thing to them. I don't know how you could see that and it not mean anything to you. But yet, if, if they don't hear uh, and they don't understand the message and the meaning behind it, and yet hundreds and thousands uh, saw Jesus dying on the cross, and most of them only mocked him. And here's the problem. They're still mocking him today. They're still real ridiculing the gospel today because they refuse to listen. Because the spirit of the Antichrist, the Bible says, is already in the earth working on the hearts of men and women. Blinding the minds of them. Uh, they're, they're wolves in sheep's clothing, Christ calls them. They are parading the pulpits in our churches. And folks, it's a Jezebel spirit. How, how can you believe that? Well, if you read the book of Revelation, you'll understand what I'm saying. Saints are becoming drunk on the wine of her fornication, John writes. The Spirit is selling lies. Selling lies. Hey, here's another one. Just got this, and, and y'all probably already seen it. There is a preacher in Mexico at a church, and he is selling plots in heaven for $100 a plot, and he accepts Visa, MasterCard, and American Express. If you don't believe that, I'll show it to you. I, I'm not trying to, to uh, expose the world today, but I'm telling you the kind of mess that is going on, and that kind of garbage is happening, and they have made thousands and ten thousands and hundred thousands of dollars on that. They're selling lies. Mixed with a little truth, 
so their flesh will receive it. It's pimping the gospel. Yeah. It's an inoculation, as I've used the uh, analogy before. It's like a flu shot. They just give you enough of the real thing so that your flesh can overcome it. Look at verse 2 with me. I'm moving along quickly. Paul says, This only what I learn of you. Receive ye the Spirit by the uh, works of the law or by the hearing of faith. He said in verse 3, Are you so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain, if it be yet in vain? He's just continuing with the questioning. He keeps on and on about it. And, and I believe it's because Paul is so overcome by how unbelievable this has become. I, I, I really laid it out there for you. Your fathers and your mothers saw this happen. They were there. How can you not believe this? And here's their conversation. Paul, Paul's talking that this is, this is, it's like he's, he's saying, this is, this is all I want to ask you. This is all I'm really trying to find out from you. Did you receive the Holy Spirit because you obeyed the law? Or was it because you heard the message of salvation with faith and you believed it? Were you doing it because a man told you to? Or did the Spirit of God grip your heart and you believed? Are you foolish because you begin this new life? You're, you're in Christ and old things have passed away and behold, all things have become new. And, and, and you're living by faith with the Spirit. So are you now, you're, you're, you're being perfected in, in Christ and, 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 and in His righteousness. Are you reaching spiritual maturity by the flesh and your own works and efforts just to keep the law? I mean, haven't you suffered enough and been through so much? For nothing? Was it was it all for nothing? I, I wonder about people that were faithful to God for years and then suddenly just fell off. And I want to say to them, what were you doing your whole life? Were you just covering something else up or were you trying to live holy and then suddenly? But it's happening every day. They're believing a false message. The current day message. People are buying into it like it's the next big thing. But I'm going to tell you something. Your works don't work. Your works can't earn it. It takes living by faith in Jesus above. Trusting, confiding in his great love. I'm telling you, it's the only safe and secure way you're going to be able to live. I want you to hear me today, and I'm trying to wrap this up. How can we be so irrational? Well, we must stop before it gets too out of hand. We've got to get a hold of some people that we know that we're close to, that is believing this garbage, that's away from God, and get their attention. Because salvation only came to you based on faith, not by what you did. For those that keep straddling the, friend, the fence, let me, let me set somebody free on that one today. You're never going to earn it. So come on over, as the song says, to the winning side, because I'm going to tell you something. The other side doesn't really want you on their side either. Their goal is just to keep you on the fence so you never go anywhere. But there's the problem, though, eventually you'll fall off the fence. You'll get tired of sitting up there. At some point, you'll fall. And you don't fall into the right side. Idle. Going nowhere fast. Just sitting stagnant. It, it's like a car. It's never meant to be just started to sit in idle. But to go forward in the right direction because faith without works, meaning faith-based movement without works is just dead and useless without moving. You're going nowhere fast. He said in verse 5, He therefore that ministereth to you the Spirit and worketh miracles among you, doeth he it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. What's he doing? He's, he's challenging them to examine the work of the Spirit in their life. He who supplies the Spirit to you, he says, 
The Holy Spirit. Who supplies the Holy Spirit? Obviously the Spirit because it's a gift from God. Does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? You know how the Holy Spirit got to you? In your response of faith. You didn't get the Holy Spirit because you just sat there and listened. You heard with that ear. The Spirit of God tugged on your heart. You saw where you were at. You believed on the Son of God. When you confessed your sins, He was faithful and just to forgive you your sins. He cleansed you from all unrighteousness. And what happened? The Spirit of God came to you. Why? Because of faith and not works. So, will you attempt to earn and deserve from God, or will you just believe and receive it? Because some people just say, I'm not good enough, and I don't deserve it. I'm going to tell you something. That's religion. And what religion has done, it has taught us that we will never be good enough, that God would never save us because we're too bad, and that we will never earn his love. And yes, two out of those three are absolutely true. We were not good enough. And we cannot earn his love, but we believe it to the point that our lives must die trying to. I lived my life for years thinking I was going to go to hell every day and I had to earn this and I and if I didn't just do this just right and if I didn't pray half the day and if I heard one word on the television whether it was my fault or not or I walked into a room, I was going to go to hell because I heard that word. What's living by faith? It's not just a song in a songbook. Living by faith is living by faith in the one who died to save you. When you do that, it makes you the one that you ought to be. You say, well, preacher, how can you say that? Because it's a gift. Because you can't buy it with money or earn it with your strength. Paul said in Romans 6, 23, For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. I, I want to ask you a question. If I ask everyone here a question this morning, maybe you're listening, I'm asking you the same question. And I'm not asking you to lift your hands or speak out loud the answer. But if I was to ask you uh, uh, this morning and I said to you, here's a million dollars. You have that million dollars because I handed it to you, Right? Because they gave it to you. And you can reject the gift because you don't think you deserve it. There are some, I mean, there's some people say, oh, brother, thank you, and, and, and run to the bank and deposit as quick as they could, open the check with mouths. But there's some people that are humble that say, oh, no, that's too much. Uh, brother, you can't do that. I, I, I don't deserve you to give me that. Or, you could understand if I was actually able to do that to you. I didn't give you that million dollars because I thought you deserved it. I gave you that million dollars because I wanted you to have it. And that's what religion has taught us. You'll get it when you deserve it. Some of y'all don't hear this this morning. And you know what religion in its way of manipulating us did? It convinced us that we will never have the gift because none of us ever feel like we deserve it. We're too bad. We made too many mistakes. Preacher, you just don't know. You're right, I don't. But he does. And he didn't give it because he thought you deserved it. He sent Jesus because he loved you. I want to ask one, one more question. I'm going to try to wrap this up. Think about that same million dollars. Would you sell me both of your eyes for a million dollars? I really want you to think about that. Some, some I say shake their head no. Some I say just staring, not knowing what to really say. A million dollars. Now, you'd never be able to see it, but here's a million dollars. What Jesus said in Matthew 6, 22, that the light of the body is the eye, or the eye is the lamp of the body. So by definition, it means that the eye is the path to the soul. 
So when Paul said in verse 1, who hath bewitched you, he was actually stating, some of you sold your spiritual eye and you sold it for whatever price they were willing to pay for it. And it's going on every week. Lies from pulpits, from so-called whatever they call themselves, and they're trying to buy your eyes and some people are selling them. He said in verse 6, Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, know ye therefore that they which are of the faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So then they which are be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. He's using Abraham as an example here. Our example of those who are justified, that are living by faith. By the words we read from Paul, I believe that it mattered a great deal to him. That God saves people by grace. Because what happened to old Saul? He had a Damascus Road encounter. The most vile of the vilest. He called himself the chief of sinners. God's grace saved him. If he saved wicked, murdering, church-burning Paul, he can save you. Not by the ground of human achievement, but by the example of a man like Abraham. What he talks about in Hebrews 11, he says, By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out to a place which he should after receive for an inheritance obeyed and he went out not knowing whether he went. That's what faith is. It's stepping out into something that you cannot see and you don't know where you're going but you're just going to believe that the one who made you and is sending you is going to keep you. He says by faith he says journey in the land of promise as in a strange country dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob the heirs with him of the same promise for he looked for a city which hath foundations whose builder and maker is God. And not just Father Abraham, but all that live by faith. Because he's going to say, these all died in faith, Hebrews eleven thirteen, 13. Not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that there were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. That's what we are. We're pilgrims and strangers in strange land. But guess what? Why are we in a strange land? Because this is not our home. We're only passing by. Our treasures and our hope are all up in the sky. My friends and loved ones wait, who all have gone before, but I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Abraham believed God that was accounted to him for righteousness, Genesis 15, 6. And listen to this. We are righteous today, but it wasn't because of a hill called Mount Calvary, but it was because of the one who hung, bled, and died on that hill. Amen. So in closing, Paul is declaring, since Abraham was made righteous by faith and not by works, Abraham was therefore the father of everyone who believes God and is accounted righteous. After all the harshness, all that happened in the beginning, this was a word of comfort to the Gentiles, and it should be hope for us today. Listen to what he said. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. It's not a blessing of wealth. It's not a blessing of, of, of carnal power. It's not, it's not a blessing of uh, uh, popularity. Though some preach that. But the Bible is telling us that the blessing is something far more precious. It's the blessing of a right standing with God. It's peace, assurance, it's the hope of glory. It's living by faith in Jesus above, trusting, confiding in his great love. From all harm safe, you remember the words, in his sheltering arm. I'm living by faith and I feel no alarm. I, I, I love what Luther said. We're getting ready to close. He says the faith of their fathers was directed at the Christ who was to come while ours rest and the Christ who has come.
God wants us to live by, by, live by faith. We sing the verses this morning. But do we really think about what we're singing or do we just let the music play? Because I care not today what tomorrow may bring. Or shadow, or sunshine, or rain. Because the Lord I know rules over everything and all my worries are vain. And though the tempest may blow and the storm clouds arise, obscuring the brightness of life, I'm never alarmed at the overcast skies. The master looks on at the Oh, don't forget the last one. I know that he'll safely carry me through. No matter what evils he died. So why should I then care though the tempest may blow while Jesus walks close to my side? This right here will cause us in the midst of faults and failures doing our best to live by faith in a faithless world we won't find ourselves looking or saying look what the world has come to but we'll find ourselves saying look who has come to this world. We bow our heads this morning. Every head bowed, every eye closed, please. If you're listening this morning, and you feel like you've been put in the mirror, you feel like your heart's pounding out of your chest, you feel so empty, so lost, so worried, it's not because that maybe your health is failing you, but it's just because that your heart's failing you. For fear, uncertainty, and worry. Hopeless, you feel unloved, you feel like there's no tomorrow. I want to tell you, there is one who cares for you. His name is Jesus Christ. He's the Son of the living God. He came to this earth, he died, and rose again to save you from your sin. And if you'll repent of your sin, confess him today, to cleanse you. Make him the Lord of your life. You'll have the promise of eternal life. Would you come to him today? He cares for you. He loves you. He wants to save you. And he can do that if you'll allow him to. Let me pray this morning.